Hello again, this is Tony Wright, FLCC and A.B. Wright Ministries. This is the 90-Day Bible Study. I want to talk a little bit about wisdom literature and the poetical writings. Uh, this is what was covered in days 39, roughly days 39 through uh, day 48. I know. Okay. Where in the world have I been? Well, I have some good news. Uh, we've gone past the halfway point. As a matter of, as a matter of fact, uh, the verse that marked that halfway point was Psalms 118, verse 8. You'll never guess what it reads. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Hold on. That was not specifically meant to apply to me. But it does apply to me. But it also applies to every other human as well. But anyway, uh, we're still we're still rolling with you. So don't worry, we, we didn't go anywhere. Let me touch on a few things. Or I probably should have put this out right from the beginning. Uh, it, it would have helped you know, kind of ease us through this uh, period that we just went through. But it's not too late. So here we go. Now, we've done this uh, 90 day Bible study a number of times. But this is the first time that we've attempted to record video clips as we go. Uh, so as you probably knew, or if not, you know, maybe you've been figuring it out. Well, you know that the Bible is broken out into, of course, the Old Testament, New Testament. That you definitely had to know. But then within each division, it's broken also into additional sections, like the Pentateuch, which is the first five books, or the Law of Moses, talking about Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, then the historical writings, uh, going from Joshua through Esther. Then the wisdom literature or poetical books that went from Job through the Songs of Solomon. And now we're entering into the major prophets. And that's going to be followed by the minor prophets uh, before we move on into the New Testament. Uh, so as we hit the wisdom literature, you likely notice that the structure of the writings change quite a bit. Now, my intent as we go through this initial iteration is to simply provide an overview of what is read. And that's without much interpretive commentary or exegesis, as they say. And then as we go through the subsequent iterations, uh, you know, for me to get more into the breakdown of the text, um, you know, beginning with some historical background, uh, historical context, uh, some character analysis, you know, of individual within the, uh, the text. And then later, some more additional analysis as, as time goes on. Does that make sense? Anyway, the poetical section just didn't lend itself to the type of summary review that I had been providing for the previous books. For instance, Psalms. Psalms represents 150 unique units of thought, where every psalm stands as an independent expression of thought. <laughs> and indeed, this is true for all the poetic writing. Now, if you have a poetic writing and I read that poetic writing, um, we can each come away with a very different interpretation of what is said. And, and that's to be expected, since what these writings represent compared to what the law or the historical writings represent. They're just different. And, and I certainly don't intend to, to, you know, to get into interpretive quagmires over what something means. And, and poetry just lends itself for that. Uh, because there are just too many things that we can agree on. So initially, I would rather you just keep focused on making it completely through the reading. Then as we go through the other iterations, we'll get more into an interpretation and all that. So what I want to do now is just cover a little more, a little information on the poetical writings before we move on with the prophet Isaiah. Boy, he's prophet. Talk about hitting him with the word, but he. But first, let's talk a little bit about the poetical writings or the wisdom literature. Some takeaways. And we'll start with uh, the book of Psalms. The Psalms, this book is sometimes referred to as Psalms of David. And as a matter of fact, David is the only author in Psalms that's mentioned in the New Testament. Now, the Hebrew title of Psalms 
is Tehillim, which basically translates to praises or hymns, which is pretty fitting when you think about it, because the main feature in the contents of Psalms is praise. Now, that's in spite of the fact that the word praise is only found in the title of one psalm. That's Psalm 145. Uh, it, it, but because this book is literally 150 independent composition, independent writing, trying to apply that same type of logical summary or overview analysis like what we've applied to the other books, it just was not practical. Now, from the earliest compilations of the writing, Jews divided Psalms into five books. The first book was Psalms 1 through 42. The second book was Psalms 43 through 72. Third book, 73 through 89. The fourth was 90 through 106. And the fifth was 172, 150. Now, there have been attempts made to come up with some uh, critical or practical reasoning for this division, but not a whole lot of success there. There have also been some efforts made to classify a psalm by subject. And it's been a little more success at that. But psalm, it still carries a very special structure and flavor that only applies to psalms. And although uh, each of these psalms have their own peculiarities, their own diversity, they all hold, at least to some degree, to that same style and same flavor. Uh, as they, you know, they represent, and together as a set, they represent a pretty consistent guide and a pretty consistent image of ethical truth. Now, these writings are all lyrical or songs which were adapted to musical instruments, and they were all religious lyrics that were designed to be used in the Jewish sanctuary worship. So their overarching feature for all of Psalm is for their devotional nature. And next we had Proverbs. Now, these writings in Proverbs, the Proverbs, the, these writings of Psalm, this, this will blow your mind. When you think about the fact that Solomon lived about 500 years before uh, those people that were known as the seven wise men of Greece or the uh, sages of Greece, and about 700 years before the time of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, who were all known to be great thinkers. So it's it's pretty clear that Solomon didn't take any of his wisdom for in, from any of these Greek sources. So it, it really adds to the credibility that Solomon's wisdom truly came, truly came from God. Now, it's another one of those books that didn't fit with the same type of review that we have been doing. Uh, there, but there are some, also some commonly observed divisions for this book, just like there was for some. Uh, Proverbs breaks down usually into five or six parts, uh, oftentimes five. The first one, uh, uh, chapters one through nine. <clears throat> and that's referred to as Solomon's tribute to wisdom and the fear of the Lord. And that's followed by Solomon's miscellaneous single verse Proverbs uh, that's found in chapters 10 through uh, 22. And then next they have the words of the wise, uh, 30 sayings and an appendix that's found in chapters 22 through the end of 24. And then chapters 25 through 29 are referred to as the Proverbs of Solomon edited by Hezekiah's men. And then finally, that fifth breakout is usually 30 and th chapter 30 and 31, and that represents the final appendices for Solomon's Proverbs. Now, what's a proverb? Proverbs is really just a brief sentence, a set of sentences uh, that pretty concisely expresses some well-known or well-established truth that's also open to you know, various illustrations and applications being uh, set to it. Now, most of the Proverbs are in couplets or triplets or some variation of that. Now, what's a couplet or a triplet? Well, a couplet is really just two sentences uh, often that, you know, have rhyming words at the end or two sentences where you have something written in the first sentence and then the second sentence will say pretty much the same thing, just say it a slightly different way. Or uh, one sentence will say something and another sentence will contrast or present the opposite of what the first sentence said. Or the first sentence says something and the second sentence further amplifies the meaning or intensity of what was said in that first sentence. Uh, that's that's pretty much uh, couplets. Now, 
Uh, Proverbs were a form of instruction that was uh, well adapted to assist the person to learn. And the parallel structure of those sentences and repetition and contrast and the comparison of thought, all of those things were, uh, you know, helped facilitate uh, the ability to remember what was being taught there. So that, that method of instruction is used a lot. And you'll find in a lot of traditional literature of a whole lot of nations, but it's still used a lot in the East. Now, uh, what stands out here, though, is in, in this book, uh, these bits of, of wisdom are sealed with divine inspiration, you know, direct from God. So he has adapted this instruction and made it plain and made it simple for us to grasp and understand uh, and to really uh, latch on to those teachings, those principles that God wants us or, you know, initially applied to his uh, chosen people for them to adapt to the things he was trying to tell them. But the follow on is this to us now. Now, Solomon, for Ecclesiastes, he was clearly the author of Ecclesiastes. Now, the difference in the style that you find in Ecclesiastes when you compare it to Proverbs or uh, later, you know, the Song of Solomon is probably because, at least at some part, uh, to the difference in the subject between what's in Ecclesiastes and what you found in Proverbs and what you'll find in Songs of Solomon. And also, it was written at a different period of time in his life. You know, Songs of Solomon was clearly written early in his, uh, uh, you know, passion, love and passion for God in his early age. Proverbs was written around that same time, maybe just a little bit later, but Ecclesiastes was writ written late in his old age. And it was uh, to sig signify his uh, the testimony of his repentance for the things he had done contrary to God. Now, it contrasts the vanity of mere human pursuits, especially when those human pursuits are the main objective, made the main objective. And it contrasts that with the real purity of God's wisdom. Now, this book is also divided it's in two parts, uh, chapters one through six, which shows the vanity of earthly things. And then chapter six through 12, which shows the excellency of heavenly wisdom. And then finally, you got into the Song of Solomon. And uh, the Song of Solomon is called Song of Songs in the Vulgate and the Septuagint, which is the Latin and Greek translations of the Old Testament. Now, Origen and Jerome, who were second and third century uh, theologians, they tell us that the Jews were forbidden to even read Songs of Solomon for anybody under the age of 30. <laughs> now, you have to admit that this book re does require a certain level of spiritual maturity, uh, you know, in order for us to properly interpret these holy mysteries of, of love that are set forth in, symbolically in this book. But for those who have reached that level of maturity, Songs of Solomon is one of the most thought-provoking of the biblical writings, par none. Hear me? Uh, the same way the other books, of the scripture present, you know, their own aspects of divine truth. These songs of Solomon, they furnish the believer with a language of holy love, uh, where Solomon's heart communed with the Lord. And that was a representation of the intensity of Christ's love. Well, to him initially, but, but Christ's love to us. <laughs> now, although this book was likely to have been written early, very early in Solomon's life, you know, way before his decline, remember, he turned away from God and he had to repent and go back. But like the other inspired books, the power and application wasn't restricted or limited to that time, which he might have intended or understood it when he wrote it. But it extends to all ages throughout time. Now, this was the poetical writings or the wisdom literature, as they call it, and uh, which David and Solomon are responsible for capturing. But God... <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, but all of it, every bit of it was provided. Uh, yeah, it was provided by God. Hey, we're back at it and we're going to be on with the prophets. And now these prophets, they went before kings and rulers and governors and queens and people of God. And they kept telling them what does said the Lord. And boy, we're going to follow some of that. Hey, but you keep reading the word. You keep checking us out on social media and keep telling your friends, tell your neighbors, the FLCC, we're still on the move and we're taking ministry back to the first love. Peace.